Hello, I want to welcome you to Tin Pan Alley. We're here on 28th Street in a recently designated a landmark. Five buildings here along the street. There were originally uh, houses that were converted for commercial use. And they would talk about it. I called Tin Pan Alley because you really, literally, when there was no air conditioning and your windows would be open, you could hear all the banging pianos and knocking out songs uh, for young songwriters. And the young songwriters, the, the people that were coming were like the young uh, George Gershwin, and young craftsmen, craftsmen of the of the music culture, and particularly Black and Jewish uh, music composers. It was them who really set the tone for the uh, music business. It brought in the African rhythm, the sort of sense of the African American presence in music, and also the Jewish uh, cultural history and, and music, and from all over Europe. Uh, as outsiders, I think both groups started to think about what would be the saleable music, and that would be music that appealed to everybody. And so they're crafting what we call today the American Songbook. And it all started on this block in these buildings, where they came together and expressed both the rhythms and the point of view that would create the American Songbook. on what New Yorkers would refer to as a stoop, or as what the Dutch would refer to as street. Same word, same, it stayed within the culture. And when you move around New York and you walk along the street, you get a real sense of history if you look up at the buildings or take in what's going on in terms of the, the activity along the street. Right now, if you come along the street, you'll see a lot of small stores that are selling clothing, flowers. It's a concentrated area of sales. And though it's not Tin Pan Alley at the moment, you get a sense of what the energy must have been like on, on that streetscape. And one of the great songs of the Tin Pan Alley period is we're talking about the 1880s, 1890s period in New York and these buildings is that they had accessibility. And one of the great songs of the period was the Sidewalks of New York. Uh, it was a song that uh, Al Smith loved as a kid growing up. And it was his campaign song when he ran for uh, President of the United States. We walk the light fantastic in the sidewalks of New York. As you stand up across the street and look up at these buildings, you'll see that they're still very distinctive. They're Italian uh, townhouse buildings that were converted to commercial use at the end of the 19th century. And so you can see they're very accessible. I'm sitting here on this stoop, uh, which is a standard practice in terms of a New York house. And in the music business, uh, as it would grow in Florida, as it went to Times Square and further north, there'd be office buildings and things that had more gatekeeper access to the buildings. And so in this period, you could come, whether you were George Gershwin or a young guy trying to get into the music business, and really a uh, strong arm a guy on the street or run upstairs and play your music. It was a much more accessible component of the music business. And I think helped facilitate in many ways the kind of rich variety that would engage in the opportunities that music publishing could offer. It's interesting as we scroll through the different uh, publishing houses on 28th Street, you'll see even though the building seems small and very accommodating, uh, each, each room really must have been represented a different shop in terms of taking in information. And a lot of the African-American composers initially just came, were paid one shot if they liked the song, and that was it. They didn't collect royalties. But as time went on, they really became long-term players on the block. But you see them moving from one music publishing house uh, to another. Uh, there was uh, the African-American a music publishing uh, group called Gotham Addicts, which was on, on the block. And they pretty much did uh, the major black performers. So if you thought of Burt 
Williams and some of those early players, Williams and Walker Company. A lot of their music was recorded uh, with that company. But I can look as I look at the body of sheet music, though, you'll see they're not just doing music that's got an African American spin. So it would go from uh, things that you would think totally traditional in terms of uh, music, in terms of the African American kind of. Uh, uh, sway or a leaning in terms of how it's presented, but others would be classical music. Uh, there's a guy named uh, Harry Burley, uh, who was a composer who codified the spirituals, and he was writing music for our operatic singers, uh, German as well as American. But if you look at the rest of the companies, you'll see that they have Italian music, uh, they have spins on the Irish, uh, traditional songs, but also in the sort of um, rough house of New York, a real mix. And so as we go through, we I sort of presented each house and their, their label as we go through the different publishing houses and some array of their sheet music as we scroll through it. And you'll see that each one has a sort of, sort of uh, leaning in terms of who they kind of cover and what kind of music they present. Usually they're really looking for star names and they would, uh, if you were someone like a Sophie Tucker or a prominent player of the period, you actually would get a song for free. There was a woman who did the first uh, show for um, uh, Oscar Hammerstein and she didn't like, he was thought he was too young and didn't like what he was writing and she reached out to her producer to get music for Irving Berlin. So they're First show, even though all the other music was by uh, uh, Hammerstein, he had to suffer through the hit song being by Irving Berlin. So you see that the, the artists really do use this uh, street as a real resource. And so you can imagine the hubbub on the street, which is really great if you even go there today, even though it's not cheap music, you'll feel the kind of energy of a concentration of one item being available on one street. As I mentioned earlier, uh, UB Blake and Noble Sissels were music uh, partners, and Noble Sissels was from the Midwest. He had grown up around uh, in a predominantly white community, and UB Blake, who was from Baltimore, always said uh, Sissels had more chutzpah. And uh, he would go take chances, and Sophie Tucker's in town. He would go to Sophie Tucker's hotel and, and pitch a song, uh, where UB Blake, being from um, Baltimore, was a little more reticent. But, and they talked, though, about coming to the street and pitching songs really for sale, right, outright, no royalties. But by the time they really started making it, UB Blake is able to buy a house in Harlow based on some of the royalties he knew he was still able to carry a mortgage. So you can see, even though it wasn't, wasn't a million-dollar royalty, the royalties in their relationship with these uh, publishing houses really did make a difference. And it really did spread their word. Uh, Scott Joplin, for example, he grew up in uh, Missouri in the Midwest, but he comes to New York to work on a play called Tremonitia and make the connection with the music publishing industry. He had already done the Maple Leaf Rag. It was a huge seller, but he realized, you know, to get tied into theater, uh, to get tied in, in a bigger way to a variety of music publishers, he needed to come to New York. And he actually comes to New York and lives on 130th Street in Harlem, has a studio in the uh, nearby theater uh, there, and that's where he dies in 1917. Uh, and so again, you can see that New York is this kind of calling card uh, for trying to extend your career to elevate it. Uh, Will Mary Cook, uh, on the other hand, actually is from New York, uh, but he went to Europe and studied violin in Europe and was a master violinist. But he comes back and puts aside the violin and really starts to work uh, on theater productions. And his first production is a, a play uh, with a partner with um, Paul Lawrence Dunbar called Corindi. And he writes sheet music for that uh, show. And he becomes like the dean of composers. He's someone that Duke Ellington referred to in, in that way. He was a, that earlier generation. He was the precursor to the jazz era, but really an elevated uh, composer, very sensitive uh, music maker. And he was married for a short period of time uh, to Abby Mitchell Cook, who was to be the lead singer uh, for George Gershwin's Porgy and Bess. She's the first to sing uh, Summertime, but she's also in some of his earlier productions just as a teenager. Uh, she's in, uh, in Dahomey and some of his earlier works. Uh, and that same um, bend uh, in terms of like accomplished composers is someone named Harry Burley. 
uh, Harry Burley, uh, along with Cook, met Dvorak when Dvorak came to America uh, to uh, appear at the Columbia Exposition in 1893. And he was really interested in being introduced uh, to what he thought was American folk music, which to him had been the spirituals. And he really felt that this music was, uh, was the leader he felt in the folks going to be the new American music. And with that uh, credential, it really did encourage the African American composers, which there were an array of in this period, to really think about that as a sort of counterpoint uh, to European. Uh, music. And so uh, James Reese Europe, another composer, is very much influenced by these uh, two gentlemen. And they really do make up this little, little sort of core, a really serious uh, composers, people who actually studied at conservatories, knew a European music, really saw the African uh, beats and rhythms as sort of a counterpoint to that, and saw a, they could have a voice in the world of music uh, in that way. And the other two that uh, are brothers, uh, J. Rosamond Johnson and James Weldon uh, Johnson. Uh, they were very, very uh, popular composers and writers, but they also were very politically astute. So the African American, what we call the African American National Anthem, Lift Every Voice and Sing, is written by them. But also the famed song, uh, Under the Bamboo Tree. That song, they said, was so popular that they last song they were going to Europe and they said the last song they heard before they got on the boat in New York was Under the Bamboo Tree. And it was the first song they heard when they got off the ship in England. And it was that popular. And they wouldn't have traveled. And here's where sheet music really does enhance your career. Uh, once the song was popular and someone maybe saw it in a theater production here or at, at some sort of stage presentation uh, or a popular American singer would go to Europe, that sheet music, and I mean, once you heard that song, helped the word really spread. So really early on, someone like uh, the Johnson Brothers would really see the power both in the sales of their music, but also visiting other places, the, the evidence that the music really did truly travel. Uh, another thing that was really interesting about them is uh, Rosamond Johnson goes on, he plays in Porgy and Bess, a small role uh, in the 1930s and, and uh, uh, when it was rehabilitated again in the 1940s. Uh, James Weldon Johnson dies really young, but he becomes an American ambassador uh, to a South American country and he gets much more involved in the politics. And so he's a really major player in the political life of, uh, of Harlem. Uh, but all of them owe a debt, all these composers that I've just mentioned, owe a real debt to Williams and Walker and their company. Williams and Walker, uh, first big show in Dahomey, really gets global attention. But they really were like, uh, I always refer to them as the sort of the Motown in terms of their productions. They really had all the top ranking people wanting to write for them or already in their company. And so the quality of their work was exceptional. And when they took to the stage in the 1890s, there were actually more whites playing blacks on stage and blackface than there were African Americans. And they actually even tagged themselves. They gave this name to themselves, the two real coons. So I'm saying, if you want coons, why don't you hire real ones? And once they got into that position, they really showed that the blacks were actually much more sophisticated, had a lot more to offer in, the, in their music and their presentation. That really took the black artists uh, to another dimension on the American stage. And, and people were really beholden uh, to them. Uh, um, Williams died really relatively young in the, in the 20s, and his partner, George Walker, died even earlier, around 1911. Uh, so uh, George uh, Walker, uh, he was married to Ada Overton Walker, a choreographer, and so she stayed uh, prominent for a little while after the, comp the team broke up. But it really was Burt Williams that had a career that extended into the 1920s. And then, so toward the end of this list, was sort of one of the new shining uh, lights is a composer named Shelton Brooks. And Shelton Brooks wrote popular music, usually sort of one-offers. I, I have not come across like whole stage productions that he produced. Uh, but he was introduced to Sophie Tucker, and pretty much he wrote all of her hit songs. So some of these days, uh, it's probably her most famous uh, a song. It's sort of her 
uh, signature song, but you go through Dark Ta Dark Town Strutter's Ball, a range of other songs that he did for her, and because of his popularity with her, he is a composer that does a lot for a lot of particularly Jewish uh, female singers. The sidewalks of New York, are, even today, are very interesting. But back then, there really were like nation states, you know, from one block uh, uh, to the next. And George Gershwin, you know, as a kid, he was a big roller skater, and he would talk about, you know, discovering a lot of the black music composers and stuff by just hearing music coming out of theaters and other uh, places. It's a sort of random introduction that you can find of almost any culture uh, in New York. And so as you went to the Lower East Side, for example, you would go in and see uh, a traditional um, Jewish foods, but also music, the, the languages of the different Jewish enclaves, uh, uh, which could be from many nations. You know, if you were a broader American, you might just think, oh, Jewish, and you just think, oh, they're all one nationality, but they're, they're Russian Jews, uh, Spanish Jews, uh, uh, from a lot of different countries, so different dialects, Russian Jews are speaking different languages or different precincts of the neighbors. So maybe even initially in appearance, in traditional garb, they would seem of all one group, but actually really different tribes of that same uh, religion. So someone like uh, an immigrant family like um, Irving Berlin uh, is picking up on the rhythms of America and uh, writing music to sort of addressing that. So by the time he's doing Alexander's Ragtime Band, he sort of set aside what have been the sort of Jewish traditions that he would have been listening to and picking up the idioms that he thought were American and something that he thought could sell. Same as Sophie Tucker, you know, was talking about Shelton Brooks and some of the songs she was doing. She would be what they would call a coon shout or someone who had like a, a Bessie Smith kind of big voice. Uh, she was great for singing uh, Yiddish songs. And, you know, within the tradition of uh, Jewish music, she had a voice and it could accommodate that. But she's also doing these sort of racier numbers of sort of crossing barriers and talks about sexuality and other uh, uh, components. So here you can look at the Wedding Jubilee uh, song. And so she's singing for a traditional wedding, but it's got little caricatures, things on the sheet music to realize it's leaning toward American uh, traditions. Or you can go to the Italian neighborhood and uh, you hear Italian songs, traditional songs from uh, Italy. But by the 1890s, part of the uh, change of, uh, after the Columbia Exposition uh, in Chicago is that acknowledging Columbus as a sort of bridge between Europe and America sort of lifts some of the hostility America had had for Italians as immigrants. And part of the celebration today, that, you know, toward the Italian holiday and why he seems... Uh, paramount in sort of the Italian culture because he was the first uh, Italian figure that uh, America sort of embraced as part of the American crossing the ocean tradition, setting the Americas as separate from uh, 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 Europe. But even here, you can see already there's an Italian rag. So there's a popular song. And I always look at ragtime as sort of being the hip hop music of its day. It's got a kind of beat that's popular across all these different groups, but the the lyrics to the music or the messages to the music are going to be slightly different uh, compared to which group you're trying to spin the music uh, to. So here's the rag beat, but it's going to speak to uh, Italian traditions or Italian stereotypes of the sort of crossover song. And uh, the next image you're seeing is a postcard of the Chinatown uh, community in New York, and I, this is a a piece of shoot music by the Johnson brothers, Rosamond Johnson and his brother, uh, James Weldon Johnson, along with uh, a guy named Cole, was a, a, another composer he often composed with. And here he's making fun of a wedding between an African-American and a Chinese uh, person. And I would pretty much say it's kind of crude in terms of the language, but where else but, but New York would that even be a possibility? <laughs> uh, that you feel you could do a song uh, make it for a sort of broader audience where you're looking across what would be cultural barriers and sort of this kind of curiosity and acknowledgement that really only comes through the sort of life in, in New York where you look across the, the fence or the barrier of the neighborhood in the sort of Romeo and Juliet uh, way and see someone else that you find attractive or connect with that maybe isn't part of your core uh, neighborhood.
And the same can be said uh, for the Irish, a very large presence in, in, in uh, New York. Uh, a lot of the holiday, St. Patrick's Day, uh, was always a big part of you know, sort of public celebrations uh, in New York. And again, you're seeing uh, the Irish rose, the shamrock, uh, images of the Irish culture are percolating in popular music. So I'm giving you sort of a heads up on what you think you're going to be listening to or what to kind of expect. But all this is uh, on Tin Pan Alley is sh uh, shuffling the cards in a certain way and bringing in its publishing, taking these touchstones uh, not only throughout New York, but really presenting them not only in America, but also in Europe as well. And so if you're from Ireland and you're hearing this music, you're starting being curious about what's going on with your cousin in New York, or if you're Chinese or Italian or a, a Jewish immigrant, you know, reading about America, these songs going back to the home country and sort of painting this sort of mythic picture uh, of America. And really the movies and the and the musical songbook really does do that, creates in the 20th century this image of America that's partly true, but partly this sort of des uh, dream desire for what the city of New York and the country of America can offer. It's really interesting when you think of all the immigrants uh, that come to America, there's some mythic stories about America that already exist in their minds. The Wild West, the sort of Native American and conquering uh, the, the West, uh, and slavery, and the sort of the sense of the Southern landholder, and the sense of maybe opportunity to come to America and be a kind of landowner and work the land in ways you probably couldn't maybe in, in, uh, in Europe in terms of getting vast stretches of land. And because of that, there's certain kinds of identities to the land in America uh, that the Af African American, along with the Native American, sort of creates as an, as an image. And so in popular music, uh, when you're getting toward the 1880s, 1890s, there's a kind of minstrelsy uh, that's really popular that's sort of telling this black story in very stereotypical ways and really kind of looking at one strata of American life, really sort of rural uh, labor uh, life in, in America. Though fascinated by the music, it's not being presented in sort of a really elevated way. It's really sort of a, to mimic and in a certain way demean the culture, even though a lot of these immigrants are coming, recognizing themselves in, in some of this in terms of actually being of the working uh, class or the labor class and, you know, from where they've come. But one of the lead uh, uh, minstrel performers, this is in the generation before uh, Al Jolson, was a Jewish um, minstrel performer named Benny Leonard. Uh, Benny Leonard was from Baltimore. Uh, he was a hometown boy along with Babe Ruth and uh, Bill Bojangles Robinson all knew each other from the Baltimore uh, days. And uh, and he presented himself in, in blackface, as you can see in the sheet music uh, cover. And he would do, uh, if you look at sheet music, there's certain terms I know is going to be African-American subject. If I see um, uh, Mandy in the title, Dusky is another word that's a referencing to, uh, uh, to African-Americans. And when that title kind of pops up, usually when I look, it's sort of some minstrel sort of association, or it could be by a black composer, but it's definitely going to focus on, uh, on black uh, life uh, or a black uh, figure. And here is a, a Mandy uh, song that's uh, composed by the Johnson Brothers, but it's being uh, uh, promoted as a song that Leonard does. So now you can see, based on Tim Penelli, the Johnson Brothers who are not at all going to any of Benny Leonard's performances. They wouldn't be in the audience, uh, but they're reaping a kind of financial reward to music publishing because his popularity on the road, that song is certainly going to add to their uh, their coffers. But as you move along and look at these uh, players, you think about these minstrel shows, uh, there was a popular component about these shows in which the, the lead performers, they would perform in blackface and maybe a couple other main uh, uh, characters, but behind them they'd have a chorus of what they would call the Pickaninnies or the Picks, it would be like the, uh, the nickname for them. And typically they were made of a much younger people, children, and children were always a sort of a crowd pleaser. They said if a show was really going bad, you could always pull out the kid chorus in the end and do some, you know, rock'em, sock'em. 
uh, delivery that would sort of r rally any audience. And so uh, you can see in the sheet music on the on the right, uh, um, the composition. And I've seen this cover where you see this Benita and the two young uh, black performers. But depending on who was singing the song, I've seen the sheet music with Burt Williams images on uh, in that spot and other uh, players. But so it's promoting uh, her performance of this song and the two young people performers. And you can see the fellow has the cane. So he's a child sort of cakewalk uh, performer, very similar to the young people in that middle picture of the chocolate cream. So you can see a very young age. These would be kids, you know, 13, 14 uh, years old. And uh, it turns out, coincidentally, in my research, uh, that in the Eddie Leonard show, uh, one of the kids who played a, a pick in the background uh, was a performer named Bill Bojangles Robinson. And in the background of the Bonita a show was a young performer named Florence uh, Mills. And I found that very interesting because two of the first sort of crossover breakout uh, black and white performers sort of on the international level are Bill Robinson and Florence Mills. And I realized partly why they probably were capable of really doing that and being sort of crossover performers. Because now, in, as background players, they're not setting the uh, the stage in terms of what the um, lead performers are doing, but they're watching, they're in an all-white audience. And these would have been segregated audiences that these blackface performers were performing for. Uh, but they could see in blackface what the actor was doing. And some of the things they might say, oh, that's, that joke's funny, you know? I would do that joke, or, oh, I would never do that joke, or it really rides by people I don't, I don't like that or what songs um, really work in terms of like contemporary songs that maybe have black idioms to them you know which ones went over really big with these white audiences so by the time they were on their own and having played in, in black you know tent shows and performances now they would both both Florence Mills and uh, uh, Bill Robinson would start to know what they could do as a singular performer to play both audiences. They wouldn't have to be one thing for one audience and one thing for something else. They started to have a sense of like today what we would call a, a crossover performer. They would already know from that earlier experience what they could do that would be them and it would be consistent for whoever uh, they performed for. So um, there was this uh, uh, saying called talk about black people always are working with a double uh, consciousness. Uh, W.E.B. Du Bois talks about that, that we do things, you know, based on what we think, but we're also depending on what arena you're in, you have to think, well, how is this other party going to receive this or how am I going to adjust myself for this other uh, player? And so you realize, and, and there are double experience here in show business, that these two performers really could cross over and with a real understanding of both black and white audiences. Things, uh, if you look at the the photograph again of the uh, the cotton pickers and the sort of image, the stereotypical image, you have to realize that these players like Burt Williams and some of these other performers, uh, we look at these costumes today, and because it's of another time period, we just think of the, this as old fashioned. We don't really see it as contemporary dress, and realizing in their stage presence sort of the way the Supremes, again, to compare it to Motown. If you think about Motown, all the names of the players, it's the civil rights period, and they're thinking about how do we show we deserve to be on the other side of the equation. And all their names are superlatives, Supremes, Temptation, Marvelettes, and they dress a certain way, the tuxedos, and they dress about you know being deserving of all the rights and privileges of, of the other side. And that's what they're doing in this period as well. These cakewalk performers and black performers are they're leveraging the music and uh, the dance performances to get themselves onto the stage and present themselves in ways they feel are truer uh, or broader representations of what African Americans uh, are. So if you think about these two comparisons, you know, you look at the couple here in the dress, he's in a sort of tuxedo uh, outfit and she's in the plumed hat and all that compared to what people sort of just associated with the African American experience. And so they're sort of mounting this other uh, diversity, this other sense of who we are, bring it to the you know public consciousness. And uh, you can start to see that also in the caliber of just the, the educated 
uh, performer. Performers, like I said earlier, had studied at conservatories, uh, could sing opera, could sing spirituals. I mean, uh, Harry Burley saw in the spiritual a, a parallel uh, music, just like Dvorak had, had seen in terms of seeing it as sort of the classical music of, of American uh, singing. And so you can start to see performers, even how they present themselves on their uh, promoting material. So uh, to the left, you can see George Walker, who's a uh, a partner in the Williams and Walker uh, company. Uh, when they started out, they were being managed by a, a company named Hertog and Seaman, who also had a theater in Harlem. And it's their lease, Hertog and Seaman, a uh, 20 year lease that allows for the Apollo Theater to be built. So for the first 20 years from 1914 to 1934, it was called Hertog and Seaman's uh, Burlesque uh, Theater. Uh, but in 1934, uh, a smaller Apollo Theater down the block uh, moved and occupied the, the bigger stage. And in 1934, it became a, a theater totally focused on presenting African-American uh, performers. But you can see, I have stationery of uh, Hertog and Seaman, and even though Williams & Walker was the only black company uh, that was part of their uh, repertoire, it's, they're listed at the top of their stationery. So you realize that they've brought some international uh, renown to them as uh, promoters and theater owners. And the same for the, the woman to the right. Her name was uh, Black Patty. And she was modeled after her voice is very similar and uh, sort of operatic quality to a singer named uh, Patty. I can't think of Patty's last name, but she's a descendant of Patty Lapone. Uh, and uh, she came uh, and sang, uh, she was an Italian background, and sang. And this woman's, Black Patty's voice was very similar. And uh, but when I went to research her, Black Patty comes back, she tours Europe. She does uh, the spirituals and all these sort of songs that sort of represent, you know, Black American uh, culture. She comes back with all these uh, medals and awards from her travels uh, in, in uh, Europe, and she plays Carnegie Hall. And it was very interesting when I looked at Carnegie Hall's records, Black Patty performed at Carnegie Hall before the White Patty did, <laughs> the European uh, Patty. So you can see there's, there's a lot of this sort of juggling back and forth in terms of prominence and sort of notoriety th these Black performers are bringing to the, uh, to the stage. And the next performer that I sort of like to point out as a female performer uh, was Eddie, uh, Abby Mitchell Cook. Again, like I said, uh, she was the wife of Will Marion Cook uh, for a period in her youth. She started out very young. She was actually mixed race. Her father was Jewish. Her mother was African American. She has a beautiful soprano voice. You can hear her sing Summertime. You can hear a recording of her singing Summertime. And she, her voice is so rich and so beautiful. You realize that uh, Gershwin, when I mean, you know that's the opening song uh, to Porgy and Bess, and you hear her voice, you realize he had to have had her in mind, even as he was scripting the show and, th and that song. She's like outstanding. Uh, but she, when uh, Indahomey goes to Europe, and the King of England's so captivated by her that she does a performance at Buckingham Palace uh, from the show. Uh, she's, you know, the Vanderbilt, the sort of the upper echelon of, uh, of uh, New York culture, uh, inviting them to parties to perform and all that. And so they start to say, even on their, uh, their logos and things, the royal performers, the royal comedians, they were coming back with the same status uh, symbols of European recognition. And so I'm now using that to allow them and present themselves in a place of prominence in the American theater culture. One of the things, like, uh, so if we think about our first image, right, sort of show the the, the, the well-dressed uh, stage performer against the, the African-American uh, field worker. Now the field worker's image is tied to slavery and this lack of sort of any rights or uh, privileges in terms of, like, being a, um, a political force. Uh, with this image that they've brought to the stage with the cakewalk and this kind of identity of a sort of middle class, uh, well dressed, you know, self uh, possessed African American now, with the music and everything, their, their message is riding the popular beat of the time. I always say it's like a bugler's uh, call, it goes over the wall, whether you like it or not. And so it's getting out there, it's being really popular, but it's also being very much associated with uh, African Americans. So by the time of uh, 1906, 1904, 1906, you can see now they're making fun of um, Theodore Roosevelt in this cartoon in blackface. He's won the second term. They're sort of applying, uh, he's sort of blackened up, he's doing the cakewalk as if the black vote uh, somehow 
uh, managed him to get in. And they show a prior president, Grover Cleveland, also holding a cake as if he, he's in blackface as well. And so sort of applying the blacks are showing up at the polls, that might be a kind of a threat. And even though they're still in that well-dressed, and but they're being shown as something that they know is popular and popular uh, culture and imagination, but they're also being presented as someone that now has a, you know, juggling uh, who gets to go into the, uh, to the White House. And so you can see the, the remnants of that kind of thinking still exists today in terms of like uh, looking at Joe Biden's election and still challenging it and challenging it basically on the black turnout. Not that there's anything really corrupt about it except for the fact that they shouldn't, in the minds of the power players, shouldn't be participating at all. Well, this is 1904, and that same question is being cartooned and, and thought about even in this earlier period. And one of the first players that really uh, looks at the black culture as an African-American and brings the African-American culture to the, uh, to the fore is a, a composer named Will Marion Cook. And he was trained in Europe, a uh, very prominent uh, teacher in Europe. He was a violinist, he comes back uh, to the United States. And he initially wants to play a violin and he's cr uh, critiqued as uh, um, America's leading Negro violinist. And he actually saw that as an insult. And they stopped playing the violin and went to producing uh, musicals. Well, Mary Cook uh, partners with this black uh, writer, Paul Lawrence Dunbar, and they write a play called Corindy or the History of the Cakewalk. And it's the first black play on Broadway. It was an all black cast. Its music becomes very popular. And it really is the kind of launching pad of uh, Cook and these players, and they're connecting. Uh, with the music publishing business because the show's popular and they're promoting this music uh, for other people to pick up. And they're even being supplemented in the newspaper. So segments of the songs will be published in ways. And so entertainment, which you don't think about today because you just pick up your phone and you hear any song in the world. But back then, someone in the family was probably a pianist, something that the families would do or, uh, sitting in their homes. And so between home life and bars and clubs were the places where this music would first start to flourish. Out of the show, Corindy, the history of the cakewalk, uh, Will Marion Cook is partnered with Paul Lawrence Dunbar, who is a prominent African-American writer and poet. Uh, like I said, this, that show was very, very uh, popular, and the music from it really traveled globally. And being that it was the history of the cakewalk, this African-American dance now becoming more publicly known, and it's really set to the rhythms of the ragtime era. So that dance and those rhythms now are big time in terms of uh, going global. And the cakewalk becomes the first dance that's uh, also uh, international uh, craze. And, and that comes on, on the heels of another show uh, that starts in New York, uh, that's composed uh, by uh, Cook and some other players, but it stars Burt Williams and his company, Williams and Walker. And Williams and Walker is like the Motown of its day in that it has all this array of talent working for them, composers, uh, Walker's wife, uh, Ada Overton Walker is a choreographer and dancer. So there's a lot of things coming together in that show uh, that is popular here in New York, but also travels in Europe. They even do a performance at Buckingham Palace. And so when that level of player is being engaged and, it's, and that music's being carried, it becomes this American emblem, it's American music, but also the Black Association is coming into it. So it's not just coming from America, but it's coming from America with this sort of melting pot component is significant to the music. We had talked a little bit about Corindy and uh, Will Marion Cook and uh, Paul on Dunbar in terms of that being the first show that was on the Broadway stage and how it used looking at the history of the cakewalk as sort of a sort of a inter in terms of the uh, public thinking about theater. The next big show and the next big crew to come along that really goes international uh, is the Williams and Walker show in Dahomey. And as I said, they were managed by Hertog and Seaman. And this theater building that you see next to uh, the picture under their logo is the Harlem Opera House, which was built by Oscar Hammerstein I. It was his first theater. Uh, he was determined to present opera. He was really a fan of uh, operatic uh, music. Uh, 
but he sees new neighborhoods, which Harlem was uh, in the 1890s when this building was built. He saw each neighborhood would need a theater and a sort of center of activity. Uh, so this is on 125th Street, uh, the main uh, commercial drag of, of Harlem. And he would build commercial properties, rental properties, and other investment properties as well. But this was his focus. Uh, the main opera house was to the back, and the front part, which looks like a commercial uh, development to the street side, eventually gets turned into a smaller theater. Uh, it becomes uh, Hertog and Siemens Music Hall, and has other kind of lives for a while, even the Little Apollo, before the Apollo moves to its other site. But they represented Williams and Walker, and that show uh, goes to Europe. And the wife of Walker is a choreographer, Ada Overton uh, Walker. So she's bringing uh, the cakewalk step, which she said was an old-fashioned dance, uh, something that had been in black shows for years. In this show, she takes that uh, dance step uh, to Europe, and it becomes this amazing uh, craze. So the, the African-American dance that I always thought was the first dance to be international was the Charleston, but in fact, it was actually uh, the cakewalk. And that performance really did captivate uh, the European uh, stage. The, the music from the show, the presentation of the uh, performers really kind of set a sort of American standard. It would be followed by Josephine Baker and other uh, players who sort of are, are American and black, but when they come back to Europe, they're seen as sort of the... Um, the empl uh, representative, uh, the emblematic representative of what African American life can be. And they become very much accepted in these cultures because they're not an influx, they're sort of like the best, uh, you know, they perceive they're getting the best uh, of the culture. So both parties are feeling really great from this uh, interaction. Uh, even Bert Williams, uh, he was uh, a Scottish Lodge, uh, had him come on board as a Lodge member, and they see him as a very special uh, a player. And so these, these introductions, these sense of like how the theater can elevate and connect the African American, uh, these performers not only had the vision that that was possible, but through shows like in Dahomey, they start to see that that other sort of African American really can take flight in a very international way. If we look at the, we're going to look at a really quick little clip here, you'll see uh, of, of the cakewalk and sort of the representative dance. It's like a sort of chorus line of dance. It's a sort of parade-like uh, dance. First they're lined up uh, frontally to the stage and then they would do like a, a promenade. It always reminds me of watching uh, Soul Train. Every time I watch clips of Soul Train on TV, I kind of see that you start out as a group but each person gets to kind of show themselves off as a, as a couple in terms of uh, uh, performance. And you can see why it's captivating uh, in the cartoon, the French cartoon here. Now you can see uh, the highly sophisticated uh, soiree of uh, the well-to-do learning and demonstrating this dance for each other in terms of something that's part of the so social uh, culture. As we look, we talked a little bit about a show uh, called Dark Town Follies. Dark Town Follies was a show that was uh, done at the Lafayette Theater in Harlem. It was one of the largest theaters in Harlem. It was one of the first to really sort of stage all black productions uh, for that community. Very elevated uh, in terms of quality of their presentation. And this show is presented in 1913. Uh, Laubrey Hill is the composer and the arranger. And some put him in the class of George M. Cohen in terms of sort of being like a show doctor. He would work on other shows uh, downtown for Hammerstein and other uh, players. But Ziegfeld, uh, Florence Ziegfeld comes and sees this show and really likes it. And he takes the choreography uh, that's done by Ada Overton Walker and the song After the Ball, That's All. He finds it, it's really a marvelous song and he introduces it to the Ziegfeld Follies of 1914. And in the same time period, Burt Williams, who's now uh, his partner, uh, has died, uh, uh, George Walker. He's the solo performer of uh, 1910 on the stage of the Ziegfeld uh, Follies. And he's a sole black performer. He's a marquee attraction, but he doesn't interact with the other performers for the most part. He's a standalone. A couple comic uh, uh, routines he would do for, with an uh, artist named uh, uh, Bert Wynn, uh, 
Uh, but other than that, he was really a sort of solo uh, performer. But he was uh, an amazing uh, mimic, and he could do pantomime. And in an interview with Catherine Hepburn late in life, she would talk about how much Spencer Tracy uh, admired his ability uh, to pantomime and, and mimic. And you can see that, when, you know, after I heard her say that, watching a lot of Spencer Tracy's uh, performances, you can see a lot of it's non dialogue. It really is facial expressions and way of conveying messages just through, through the physicality uh, of, of the body. Uh, well, Burt Williams is so popular, two things are kind of colliding in 1913. Uh, uh, this show, Dark Town Follies, and its routine and numbers, and uh, Burt Williams' uh, marquee talent. So much so that uh, Biograph Studios, who's doing silent films, engaged both groups to shoot a movie, which was called the Lime Kiln Social uh, Club. And uh, they shoot it in New York studios and in, in outside, in uh, picnic scenes outside in New Jersey. And Biograph shoots all of this for what they see is going to be a crossover uh, show. Uh, but around the same time this is happening, Birth of the Nation is produced and is released as a movie. And they realize that this show about sort of black life, uh, you know, picnicking, it's a real African-American engagement, uh, isn't probably going to fly to the general public. But the, uh, so it never gets released. It never even gets really edited as a full movie. But the footage turns out, uh, Biograph, when they close, the Museum of Modern Art takes all the uh, footage. And for 30 plus years, they never even look at it. But recently, they looked through that footage. They've since put it together to, based on the scripts and some of the other material they had. So it kind of follows the storyline that they project for the film. But the great thing about it when you watch it is that you see the interaction between all these players. Some of the players, uh, like uh, J. Aubrey Hill, he's just playing an extra in it. But there's a kind of a camaraderie. Abby Mitchell Cook is in it. But there's a camaraderie amongst the performers that really is a kind of relaxed presentation of any black picnic or social gathering uh, would have. And it's, it's almost heart-rendering to see that they didn't really make it uh, as a popular film because you really do feel like there's a real kind of natural relationship. Uh, the dance numbers that they do, you realize then there was no sort of film choreographer. They sort of just set the you know beginning of the end to where you should move. And you realize they're doing the routines that they did from their shows and other things. And there's such a sort of uh, relaxed, uh, natural quality to the performances is that you realize how much of a loss uh, that it never really uh, met the open market in its, in its day. And I really recommend it to you if you ever get a chance uh, uh, to see it. But I, I show that, I, I mention that because uh, later on by the 1940s, uh, people are looking back on this period and making movies. And one of the movies that was made that was looking back at the ragtime era is a 1944 uh, film starring Judy Garland called Meet Me in uh, St. Louis. Judy Garland's at her best. Uh, uh, it really is magical in the sense of presenting sort of the sense of Americana in the turn of the century. Uh, but there's no African American, you know, in the town sitting around or in the house. There's no, but there's a total lack of uh, any diversity in this clip, in the, in the sense that uh, the music is written by uh, uh, Bob Cole and Rosamond Johnson, and mostly we wouldn't know that uh, unless you're a music scholar. And the sense of their legacy is sort of lost, even in the popularity of the clip and the movie. And then to see them dance and sort of slip into the cakewalk routine, you know, very few of us know Ada Overton Walker or George Walker in terms of the performances. And yet they did a lot. They started out with all those obstacles, the minstrelsy and the sense of what they, what they thought an African-American could be, and really turned them into Americans, took that music and that dance and that culture and made them citizens of the American culture. And yet the representation and the connection is lost. And I think those are the challenges. As we look at places like Tin Pan Alley and the music culture of America, it's not that we're diminishing the achievement, it's that the achievement has so much more to offer us. as such a much deeper and richer story that the story would enliven all of us, improve all of us, give us something to look at and revel at that America really is made of all the little parts.